So, I just finished FromSoft's newest edition of the action RPG genre. Sekiro, Shadows Died Twice, and it was a great experience. The combat, while notably different from Dark Souls and Bloodborne, is refreshingly addictive and challenging, forcing players to control the ebb and flow of each encounter to be successful. The level design and world building demonstrate that FromSoft are still masters of their craft. The landscape is hauntingly gorgeous, densely layered with hidden items and strange and interesting characters, while simultaneously oppressive, dangerous, and lonesome. Much like the games which form its unique pedigree, Sekiro will never ever let you forget that you are facing down a hostile, uncaring world that will kill you over and over again. This feeling of facing overwhelming odds and triumphing over enemies that initially seem impossible is the reason I keep returning to FromSoft games. And I would imagine, if you're watching this, it's the reason you do too. Now, all that being said, is it a game I would recommend to others? Well, no, not to everyone. Sekiro is a crushingly difficult game that often accepts nothing less than perfection from the player, and I would wager a fair number of them, veteran Souls players included, will end up permanently shelving the game after spending too much time stuck on an enemy that they're struggling with. And in a $60 game with no summoning and no ability to grind out levels, that's a pretty hard sell. And the reason I would recommend Sekiro only to people I know would be amenable to that value proposition. Cannot throw away such loyalty. But apparently games journalists don't see it that way. Shortly after the release of the game, we're seeing a bevy of articles bemoaning the lack of an easy mode. A sentiment I find mildly confusing, and because I care about the integrity of the video game industry broadly, and FromSoft games particularly, moderately enraging. But most of all, I find it indicative of the absolute piss-poor state of modern gaming journalism. Take, for example, this article by Dave Thier of Forbes. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice needs to respect players and add an easy mode. Wait, what? In what way is it respectful for developers to dumb down a game? Well, Thier argues, the fact that these games don't have any difficulty settings means that only a certain sort of player with the time, inclination, reaction speed, and lack of physical issues will ever see the final boss fight anywhere but on Twitch. This is a problem. Well, I think it's likely true that many people will never see the end of Sekiro. Hell, even I had my doubts when I reached the final boss. He fails to explain why this is a problem. Is every game made for every person? I would argue that they're not, but let's assume for a moment that this is true. Fear certainly does, after all. He's written nearly identical articles regarding Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne. So what then is his proposition? An easy mode does not have to be complicated. Ideally, I'd like to see the sort of deeper customization that Celeste has, but all you need to do is turn up the damage the player does and turn down the damage the enemies do. That's it. Now, bearing in mind that this fellow is purportedly a games journalist for a living, consider the implications of this statement, that we simply allow the player to alter damage tables at will, and that this somehow does not compromise the integrity of the developer's vision for the feelings that the game is meant to engender. According to Miyazaki in a GameSpot interview, he wanted players to feel despair at first and then tiny hope while facing bosses. And for my money, the game nails that feeling perfectly in its current state. It's difficult for me to imagine that giving the player an easy escape from a difficult encounter is somehow respectful. It's easy, however, to imagine a player robbing themselves of their own accomplishment by using such features to bypass bosses because they lack the patience to learn the patterns and telegraphs. In fact, this is exactly what James Davenport of PC Gamer details in a lengthy article documenting his use of a slowdown mod to defeat the final boss of the game. While he denies in both title and article that he feels any guilt for finishing the game this way, and admits that the game is about overcoming challenges, he also makes excuses throughout about why he couldn't complete the boss legitimately. He was particularly frustrated by a lightning attack in the third phase, lamenting that there's a return mechanic, but it's rarely practiced outside of boss battles until the very last stage. This statement is framed to make it sound as if the lightning return mechanic is rarely used in the game, when in fact, there is nearly an entire area and a required boss dedicated to teaching you how to return lightning bolts to their sender. Partially because he couldn't be bothered to properly learn this mechanic, this author decided to cheat instead. While he is certainly free to do as he pleases on his PC with his copy of the game, Davenport argues that slowdown should have been an included option out of the box, essentially just because he wants it there, and despite the fact that the mod exists. In perhaps what I think is the most insidious article I've found on this subject, Steve Spawn, Chief Operations Officer and Community Outreach Director for Able Gamers Charity, attempts to reframe the issue entirely as one of accessibility. So let's get something out of the way now. I fully support accessibility options, such as key remapping and colorblind modes, to make more games playable to more people. But accessibility options are not the same as an easy mode, 
This tweet in which Spawn states, accessibility means options, not easy gameplay, would make it seem as though he agrees. So what accessibility features would Spawn look for in Sekiro? He points to a list of proposed options tweeted by Matt Thorson, developer of Celeste. If Sekiro had a Celeste-style assist mode, combat speed 50-100% to sets game speed while enemies are aggroed. Resurrections plus one or infinite, invisible while sneaking, infinite posture, invincible, while drinking gourd, or always. Seems reasonable, Steve says. It's not. Infinite invincibility is never a reasonable option outside of cheat codes. If you have no loss condition, then you have no game. In which case, there's no reason to play the game instead of, say, watching a Let's Play on YouTube. He goes on to attempt to preemptively rebuff some of the counterarguments. I'm not going to address them all here, but I'll link them in the description if you want to check them out for yourself. I saw a gamer XYZ play, insert game name here, so the game is accessible and doesn't need any more accessibility. If they can do it, you can too. The problem is gamers with disability are not spark plugs. We aren't interchangeable inanimate objects that all have the same challenges. We are human beings with various disability-related challenges that each of us face, even within the same disability. Just because one person can do something doesn't mean everyone else can. He's absolutely right. There are countless disabilities that affect people's ability to play video games. The question, though, is how many of those can we reasonably accommodate? Even if FromSoft decided to implement all of your proposed changes tomorrow, that would not help a blind gamer in the slightest. Is Spawn expecting a game developer to be able to anticipate all the disabilities of all their players? That is an impossibility, and we must ultimately accept that not all games will be playable by all people. But neither can he accept this point. All games aren't meant for everyone. The most heartbreaking of all the arguments. Games like Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice just aren't meant for everybody. They say it's meant for a very specific group of people, and if you aren't in that group, you just have to find a new game. Gaming is for everyone. No. No, it's not. Hard fucking stop. There are real limitations in the real world that prevent people from playing some games. That's part of being human and it will never change. My dad, for example, loves Halo, but he gets really bad motion sickness if he tries to play first person shooters. No number of articles or social media posts or calls or emails to the developer will ever help that. He had to accept it and move on. It's the sad reality of the world we live in. Ultimately, the reason I draw such a hard line on difficulty in FromSoft games isn't because I'm trying to be an asshole or keep people out of the Get Good Club. Try to understand, in the Soulsborne games and now in Sekiro, death and difficulty aren't just normal game mechanics. They're part and parcel of the stories and the lore of the games themselves. In Dark Souls, you're undead and you're brought back to life repeatedly because of the linking of the first flame. In Sekiro, you're infused with the power of the dragon's heritage, a power which is sought by Genichiro Ashina. The divine heir will be coming with me. Have you ever wondered why Soulsborne games show you died or death on the screen and not the more traditional game over? It's because the game is only over when you, the player, lose the will to continue. When you complete a Souls game, you've overcome not just the difficulty of the game, but a test of your will. That is the core conceit of a Souls game. And that is why difficulty matters so much.